answer, that would be spectacular. All right, so GH is a transgender woman. Before I go any further, what does transgender woman mean? Would someone like to give us a Biologically male. Right, exactly, thank you. So a person who is born biologically male, um, but is identifies as a woman and is in some, you know, some combination of maybe hormones, maybe surgery. Uh, it's really individual though. So, you know, never assume um, what part someone has that's usually available in their chart or if it's really important to um, what kind of care you're providing, you can ask. And there are ways of course of asking that are not, um, you know, offensive. Okay, so GH is a transgender woman with a newly diagnosed prostate cancer. Her Gleason score was calculated as four plus three equals seven. She was so stressed out during her visit with the urologist that she forgot to ask the physician what four plus three equals seven meant. So please choose a correct response. So what do you guys think? Uh, B. So most of the largest tumor was grade four and the next largest area was grade three. Exactly. Um, and the, one of the reasons why we have this composite score is because, again, as I mentioned in the lecture, prostate cancer can be really heterogeneous and a prostate can actually have multiple areas of cancer and even different kinds of cancer. Um, or I mean, they're all pretty much adenocarcinoma, but they may have different grades and they may have different levels of aggression as well. And so we want to make sure that we are kind of determining, you know, which the largest areas are and what their likelihood is in terms of risk, because then that's how we decide how to treat somebody. Good job. Okay. Um, your patient is to receive Firmagon for newly diagnosed prostate cancer. The oncology fellow provided you with an order containing flutamide 250 milligrams PO Q8 hours for 14 days to begin seven days prior to Firmagon and continue seven days after for the loading dose. The oncologist wants to know when his patient's flutamide RX will be ready for pickup so he can coordinate with a clinic for the injection appointment. So please choose a correct response. So what should we do for this guy? C. So flutamide is not necessary. Right, exactly. So why is flutamide not necessary with, uh, or why is Firmagon not necessary for uh, sorry, why is flutamide not necessary for Firmagon? Too many Fs. The Firmagon doesn't have the flare like the other LHRH uh, agonists. Exactly. Yep, exactly. Because it's an antagonist, right? So it immediately lowers levels of testosterone. So you're probably asking yourself as I went through all those drugs, um, why don't we just give Firmagon to really anyone who qualifies for ADT therapy. So we don't have to give them the hepatotoxic drugs like flutamide, et cetera. And the answer is, you know, there's not really a good one, except that a lot of insurance companies don't really cover it. It's a lot more expensive. It also requires a loading dose. Um, so again, that's more expensive and that's more, uh, you know, appointments, I guess, in, in uh, an insurance company's mind. And also the other problem is, or I guess, yeah, the other problem is that flutamide's cheap. So a lot of these anti-androgens, they're really old. They've been out for a very long time. So an insurance company would rather have somebody take two drugs, especially when they're cheaper than one more expensive drug. Um, my preference, of course, is if the patient can get coverage, you know, I like them to get this instead because they do tend to um, not have to have some of the other side effects associated with the anti-androgens. Any questions on that before we move on? Okay. So please match the following drugs with their pharmacological class. All right, so what is Lupron? Alachavich agony. Exactly, and that's why we get the flare, right? Because it has to create a, a feedback loop in order for the body to stop producing uh, testosterone. Okay. Um, what about Elixin? And we were just talking about it. The first gen antiandrogen. Exactly. And that one we have to combine with these LHRH agonists to help, again, prevent that flare. Um, what about Provenge? 
how do we classify Provenge? Vaccine. Exactly. So we're actually taking out white blood cells from a patient through leukophoresis, and then we're essentially teaching them how to respond to prostate cancer and then infusing it back into the patient. You know, so if you considered an immunotherapy or a vaccine, either of those is a reasonable option. Um, the problem, though, is that now we actually have immunotherapy agents like pembrolizumab that we can use. And so they have categorized as a vaccine so that people don't get confused. But essentially, the same principles apply. All right, what is Zytiga? Androgen synthesis inhibitor. Exactly. And uh, so for Zytiga, that's the fine, or I'm sorry, the uh, abiraterum. What's another formulation of Zytiga that came out recently? It's better absorbed. Yeah. Yep, exactly, Yansa. Um, all right, and then Extandi. Which one is Extandi? Second generation anti androgen Exactly. So the nice thing about Extandi is that we don't have to add in the Casadex or anything else, right? Um, okay, any questions about that before we move on? Okay. A 62-year-old patient with an ECOG of 1, stage 4 prostate cancer with solitary metastasis to the bone, is a good candidate for Provenge. True or false? True, right? Excellent. Um, so what is an ECOG of 1? Does that mean somebody is, like, basically doing okay or they have a poor performance status? Good performance status, this is between zero and one. Exactly. Um, there's also another really important piece of information in this uh, description of the patient that explains why Provenge is okay. And what is it? It's not um, liver meds or it's not visceral meds. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So this patient only has metastasis of the bone, is otherwise very healthy. And so Provenge really is one option that we can use. So when I talked about separating out, you know, what kinds of therapies are appropriate for patients based on having no visceral metastases or visceral metastases, um, Provenge is a good option. What's one um, kind of, uh, I guess, downside of Provenge? Do you guys remember? Uh, it doesn't lower your PSA. It doesn't lower your PSA, absolutely. Um, so it makes it a little bit harder to know if it's efficacious compared to some of the other uh, treatments out there. But what's another reason why most people are, or many institutions are like, I'm not doing this? It's expensive. It's really expensive. Do you remember how much it is per uh, ther or per therapy? Or like for the therapy? Yeah, it's $93,000. Now, what's funny, I guess, not really in a ha-ha way, but when Provenge first came out, it was basically kind of before CAR T cell therapy really started to like explode onto the scene. And so when we saw the, the price tag for um, Provenge, we were all like, oh my gosh, that's so much. And of course, now with CAR T cell therapy, you know, you can be in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, but again, you know, one of the issues with prostate cancer and why we're really trying to evaluate what overall survival looks like for patients. Um, and if, you know, some of these therapies are really reasonable is looking at how much time, extra time it gives patients, right? Because I showed you that, um, that table kind of at the end of the um, lecture talking about like the different overall survival. Now in that table with overall survival, what, what number was missing or what other information was missing? So we talk about overall survival. What other numbers do we talk about when we talk about response to therapy? Anybody want to take a stab at it? I didn't write it down. Life expectancy? Well, so yeah, so overall survival is essentially tied 
somewhat to life expectancy, but although you're right, they, they don't talk about whether or not someone has like six months or more life expectancy, things like that. But there's something else that I, as a clinician, in order to really kind of convince a patient or consent a patient for therapy, I like to be able to tell patients about progression-free survival. So progression-free survival is ideally the time that someone's disease isn't getting any worse. And so what that means hopefully is that they're living with relatively few symptoms, or at least their disease isn't making them sicker, right? So the problem with that table is it just showed an absolute cutoff for overall survival. And in most of the cases, it was, you know, five months or less. And, and especially for, um, for things like, you know, once patients have had chemotherapy, the increased benefit may be only two and a half months uh, additional overall survival. So when we start talking about these drugs, I really want you to look critically at um, not just how long people are living, but also if they're doing research into how well people are living during that time. And that as a pharmacist, this is really important information because it may help me decide whether or not I think something should be added to a formulary, right? So in the case of Provenge, it's $93,000. It's also really labor intensive. You have to have a patient come in. You have to have an ability to do a leukophoresis. You have to be able to send it out, have the patient come back. Um, you know, even though they're receiving their own cells, it's common for patients to have almost like a serum sickness type experience. So, you know, they can also have hypersensitivity reactions and things like that. Um, so I want you to be able to kind of take a step back and say, all right, I know this is a new drug and it's fancy, but does this make sense? Should we really use this? Do you guys have any questions about that before we move on? Okay. Um, so this answers kind of the next question, right? So most of the mainstay therapies for metastatic prostate cancer prolong overall survival by, by at least six months or more. Is that true? It is false. And it's really sad, actually, um, that we haven't made more strides. Uh, probably one of the things you saw compared to ovarian, well, actually very similar to ovarian cancer. Um, we don't have a whole lot of drugs available in terms of chemo for metastatic prostate cancer patients, right? So we do a lot of cycling of like, okay, we give them an, an additional ADT or a different kind. If they don't have METs, we, visceral METs, we can give them Provenge maybe, but you have to be healthy enough. We really only have a couple of different chemotherapies um, that we use generally for patients and they're relatively toxic, especially for bone marrow. Um, so unfortunately, we really just don't have a lot of great options at this point for, uh, for patients. Any questions about that before I move on? Okay. So please select the correct statements regarding prostate cancer. Select all that apply. So is the median age of diagnosis 66? Yep. And that really gives you insight into what comorbidities a patient might be coming in with, right? When they're diagnosed with prostate cancer. So if a person is diagnosed and they're 70 years old, you start work. Is that from my end or her end? Function as well. It's her, it's her internet. Oh no. Did you guys? It was it up there. Oh no, I'm sorry. Shoot. Okay. Uh, which was the last thing you heard me say? Comorbidities. Comorbidities. Okay. Yes. When you're older, obviously we have to worry about comorbidities and that's why this number median age of diagnosis of 66 is important because we have to assume that patients may be coming in with, uh, with issues. 95% of prostate cancer are uh, adenocarcinoma. That is true. Uh, Asian Americans are disproportionately represented. No. no. Which group is disproportionately represented? African American. African American. She's frozen again. So unfortunately, even though <clears throat> overall- we, we lost you again, Dr. Leva. Oh. Sorry. I, okay. I think uh, after Pinkle uh, answered African-American, we 
we lost you after that. Okay. I apologize profusely. My, my internet sucks today. Um, so you may have to hear me repeat myself or just feel free to jump in and tell me that you can't hear me. So thank you. I appreciate that. Um, okay. So African-Americans disproportionately affected, very problematic, especially when we look at mortality rates, the mortality rates, not just the incidence and the, the aggressiveness of the cancers, but also um, the mortality rates are very high compared to their white male counterparts. Um, and this is an area that we all need to do a better job uh, from screening early to trying to identify maybe alternative therapies that are more genetically appropriate. So we figured that out with hypertension, for example, a number of years ago that some drugs work and some don't. We need to do the same kind of research um, more than likely for this. Okay. Um, so most patients uh, who have symptoms have early disease. Nope. It's just like uh, ovarian cancer, right? It's kind of a silent killer for patients if they're not getting their PSA done, screened regularly. Um, incidentally, do you guys remember what is the rel like the frequency that we're supposed to do for PSA? It's kind of a trick question. Do we have one? <laughs> no, it's ridiculous. They just say Before I freeze again. We lost you again. Damn it. Okay. We lost you after the frequency of PSA. Ah, uh, okay. That's okay. Any other questions? <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. Can you say that part again? <laughs> yeah. Okay. No problem. Um, so most patients who have uh, symptoms have advanced or metastatic disease and the problem with PSA screening is we don't have um, a frequency that is recommended. It's just, you know, the, the um, guidelines say, you know, based on provider discretion and patient preference. So some health systems like Kaiser will do it yearly. And some urologists, especially if you already have BPH, they may do it more frequently. Okay. Did you get... you? Lost you after urologist. Cut off again. She's not back yet. I am. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> I was, I, I realized that you guys froze. I'm, I'm really sorry. You know what? Um, I'm trying to figure out if there is something that I can do to make this better. I'm going to try and just get through this. And then if I need to, I'm going to use my phone as a hotspot. Uh, it shows that I have full signal, but I don't know what's going on. Okay. I'm sorry about that. Any questions before I freeze again? And I just did. Son of a bitch. <laughs> okay. I know. I froze. You're not or frozen. Oh, I'm not frozen. Okay. It froze on my, my computer. So you may hear all kinds of weird swear words. Sorry. Okay, <laughs> um, your patient picks up a new prescription for Yansa and methylprednisolone. Which counseling point should you share with him? Methylprednisolone helps prevent side effects, edema and electrolyte imbalance. Exactly, um, and there's really no good reason why we use methylprednisolone instead of prednisone. Uh, they just decided to get fancy, so <laughs> that's what they use instead. Um, so yeah, exactly. It helps uh, cancel out some of the mineralocorticoid effects that happen when we give um, Zytiga or Yansa. All right, excellent. So PSA is used as a screening and sometimes diagnostic tumor marker. Which of the following drugs or activities may interfere with the validity of the test? A. That's right. We know that NSAIDs decrease inflammation and we know that prostate-specific antigen um, is a, uh, essentially, it's a protein that is expressed on the cells of the prostate. Um, and in the case of prostate cancer, it's often overexpressed. There's actually a more sensitive 
a test and specific test that they're working on for um, doing like molecular imaging and better detection for people who don't have an elevated PSA and it's uh, called prostate specific membrane antigen. Um, and that at some point may replace a PSA. So we'll see. So bone scans don't affect PSA ejaculation. Usually it's within 48 to 72 hours and a digital rectal exam, it's usually within the same day. All right. Um, and then, so why do we use flutamide? Hopefully like you guys have this ingrained in your brain now. Um, why do we use flutamide in combination with gazrolin for seven to 14 days? The flare. That's right. Preventing the flare. Okay. And last, but definitely not least, gyptana is used when patients are not able to tolerate taxol. Is that true or false? Yeah. Do you want to build a snowman? Here we go. Guess who's back? <laughs> sorry, guys. Uh, Jeptana, what? Sorry. So you said false, but why? Taxol is brand new for Paxlotaxel. That's right. And when do we use Jeptana? What What is the indication for Jeptana? When docetaxel doesn't work. That's right. Exactly. So it's not a like, you know, we don't just interchange them. They're not interchangeable drugs. If you fail docetaxel, then we have one other mitotic inhibitor that is in the same class that we can use. Exactly. What's one of the biggest problems with Jeptana though? compared to docetaxel? Bone marrow suppression. Bone marrow suppression. Yep, there's a black box warning. People have died from febrineutropenia and uh, severe infections. So we worry about patients um, you know, receiving Jeptana. And in fact, in most institutions, we just prophylax with GCSFs from the first cycle. Awesome, okay. Um, any more questions? Doctor, they real yeah. quick. Sure. Um, I understand now what you said about the not being able to tolerate. When I read it, I thought not being able to tolerate meant like they failed it. Uh, so, oh, no, no, no. Yeah. So, so, right. So if I were to use a phrase like, um, so if somebody progressed on therapy, I would say treatment failure. Um, toleration is very different, right? So it's like if you had a toxicity and you weren't able to uh, receive the medication, that would be, that would be different. Does that make sense? Shoot. I think you all froze again where I did. There we go. Okay. So we're good on that. Did I completely disappear on you again? I can hear you. Okay, that's good. Sorry, guys. <laughs> All right, um, I'm getting a chat here. Uh, okay. So, um, so we'd never use Jeptana uh, interchangeably with docetaxel, right? And Taxol, we don't even use in um, prostate cancer. We use Taxotere only. Okay, awesome. So I'm going to stop sharing for a second here.